What is up, guys? Alex from Anacreates here. Welcome back to the Anacreates podcast. Today, we're going to be talking about what you should spend your money on while making your record. What, Where do you put your money? What's the best use of your money and your time? And, and just when you're thinking about budgeting your record, what do you prioritize? What's really uh, worth prioritizing? Because these days, you can see a lot of different options out there. There's a lot of DIY options. There's a lot of uh, cheap options. There's a lot of over expensive options. It's just the playing field is so vast. And a lot of people get confused and I get a lot of questions about this. And that is, where do I put my money? What, what should I spend money on? What should I spend time on? I have interest in certain parts of this. I don't other parts of it. What do I do? Like, because I mean, at the end of the day, you could just find the biggest and the best that spend the most amount of money and get the best guys in the world and, and all that kind of stuff. But is it really worth it? And that's the thing that for a lot of new artists, what's worth the money? What is actually worth the money? And what's not really worth the money? At the end of the day, what isn't worth the money to you? And, you know, I'll say right off the bat that there is obviously going to be a lot of different opinions. There is definitely a lot of different things for various, um, for di various types of projects, for various genres, for various uh, different people and what they're coming into it with, what their knowledge is, what, if it's a band with a bunch of different people that can kind of delegate, whether, what you know, how much money you have, what is your budget? And it's all going to play a factor into this. So this is by no means a blanket statement for everything, but this is to try and just help you uh, think about that. And I was talking to somebody about this recently. So I decided, you know what? I want to have this discussion on the podcast. I want to talk about this on the podcast. And I feel like this is not going to be the last time we have this style of discussion because the options are endless depending on what you are looking for as well. And so, you know, but the biggest thing is that people don't often understand what the options are, no matter what they don't, they don't think about what the options actually are for them and their situation. They can make some good uh, judgment calls once they actually understand it. But a lot of people don't understand the whole picture. What is actually in this picture? So that's what I want to talk about today and uh, put some of my thoughts out there to hopefully help you guide, either give you some ideas of what to look up and what questions to ask or where to go from here. Um, what you should think of when trying to really plan your budget and all that kind of stuff. Cause it, I guess it comes down to at the end of the day, you're budgeting when you're budgeting your record, what's worth it, what's not. So hopefully this helps you understand that a bit better. If you're coming at this, or if you know somebody who's coming at this, trying to figure out where do I put my money? What's worth it for me? What's not worth it for me? Uh, because yeah, sometimes this can get, you can get very lost. And I've seen a lot of bands that, and artists that do the right thing part of the way. And then they kind of put money into something else. And you're like, but you know, you, you don't want to put all of your money into marketing when you haven't spent money on making a good product because marketing a bad product isn't going to help you anymore in your whole journey as making a great product and then putting it out in front of people with maybe a little bit less marketing kick behind it. And you know, that kind of, that's probably better to build up your whole brand as opposed to just dumping a whole bunch of money into marketing something that you don't even like as an artist. You know what I mean? So we're not going to go into actually marketing and anything beyond making the record from at this point, we're just talking about making a record when you're coming up to make a record. What, where do you put your money? Where do you put your time and what things do you, should you think about? So, um, you know, there's different options. And like I said, it all depends on your genre and your style of project. So what do I mean by that? First off, well, genre, um, people that have, that, they, that do rock or jazz are going to have different needs. Uh, people that do hip hop or are solo singers and want to do pop, they are going to have different needs than a rock band. And a rock band is going to have different needs than a jazz band or a blues band or a band that plays together all the time versus somebody who, you know, they're, they're jamming in their parents' basement and want to make a, a record. You know, all of those things play into it. So I I can't even cover all of the different genres because, you know, very specifically, because they're all going to need different things, especially when it comes to recording, especially when it comes to recording. However, the, uh, what I'm, what I'm going to say overarchingly does apply to most genres and most situations. Um, the second thing is what the, what the project is, what's the style of project. So what I mean by that is, you know, is it an EP? Is it five songs? Is it one song? Is it 10 songs? Are you doing a record? Um, 
you know, is it for something where you can try and get money from it, uh, from, you know, whoever you're giving it to, is it for like a, a movie project or something like that? Can somebody else help pitch in to get this done? Uh, do you know people? Um, do you have people involved that have different skills than you do? Or, um, you know, if you're a band, sometimes there's always a recording guy in the band, uh, when you're a solo artist that you may not have that option because you are only you, um, you know, there's all that kind of stuff. And do you have friends that can do parts of this or where, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and that's totally fine. And obviously every situation is different. Every project is different. Every group is different. Um, who they know is different, all that kind of stuff. But, um, you know, hopefully this gives you thinking of in general. Uh, but yeah, it, it all depends on, uh, what your project is. Cause put it this way, if you're a band and you're looking to record and you can have a, you know, whatever budget and you can get one day in the studio or two days in the studio, but you're doing one song, maybe that's not totally worth it compared to, you know, for one song, you get one day in the studio and it's going to cost you a thousand dollars for that day in the studio to get your one song, to get drums. And, and that's basically all you really need the studio for, but you have to book a day. So you might as well do everything else. Or if you're doing a record, which is 10 songs, but you think, you know what? The drummer's really good. We can get 10 songs of drums in two days. So now your budget has gone up to 2000 for the recording process for the actual recording day in the studio. You can do everything else yourself, but you know, now you're getting for, for a little bit more money. I mean, double your money, but a little bit more, you are actually taking full advantage of that and getting 10 songs, 10 times the amount of stuff out of the studio as what you were going to get in the first place with yeah, book one day for one set of drums. And well, I guess since we're here and we have to spend one whole day because that's the policy of the studio, you know, it's not a great trade-off and you have to think about that for yourself. What are you willing to do and what are you willing to sacrifice or not sacrifice or what's worth it to you? Um, you know, there's a lot of people that, that just want to hire somebody to do certain things because they don't want to do it themselves. Can you do a lot of things just in John, in general, in recording or even around your house? Can you do it? Yes. There are DIY options for pretty much everything, but sometimes people want to pay somebody to do something just to not have to worry about it. I know a lot of people that pay me to edit. Could, uh, could people edit? Absolutely. But do they want to edit? No, they don't want to edit. They don't want to sit there for hours. They would rather work longer at a different job or whatever it is that they're doing or spend more of their budget to get me to edit it and to know it's done well and good. And they know it's going to sound good and they know it's going to be done fast. Then they would, they wouldn't want to instead learn to edit it themselves and spend hours editing it. Yes, it would save them money, but it wouldn't save them time or it wouldn't be as good or they wouldn't feel like it was as good or they just don't want to be bothered. So, you know, it all also depends on that style. Like what is it that you bring to the table? What are you willing to do? And what isn't really worth it to you at all? You know, where are you willing to put your money? But we have some, uh, some thoughts in the different categories of what you should think about when you're deciding, is it worth it or isn't it not worth it? So, you know, how much are you willing to learn? How much peace of mind do you want? And how much do you just want off your plate? Um, also plays a big factor into this, you know, peace of mind as to somebody else doing it and knowing it's done well. Uh, sometimes that, that is worth a lot. And sometimes that's not worth a lot. If you know, if you think you know what you're doing, then more power to you. You don't need that extra peace of mind. Some people, they want that. Um, so obviously very different. So we're going to, what we're going to do is we're going to go through, uh, some scenarios and some thoughts to, for the four kind of main elements of making a record. So that is production, a recording, mixing and mastering. So production, I mean, producers, um, in, in some genres that's beat makers. And, and that's actually people that make the record for you because it's a lot of digital elements and they make it themselves. Um, and for rock, it's a producer that kind of is overarching, uh, making decisions, helping you craft the song a bit more, that kind of thing. Uh, that's, that's a production or a producer, uh, recording is the, obviously the recording of it, the actual getting it onto, into the computer, <laughs> getting the files recorded. Um, then there's mixing, which is the mixing element of it, where you take all those files and you actually mix it. Um, I, I'm going to put editing into that as well, I think, or, or somewhere in between those two. Um, and, and so mixing is that stage and then mastering, which is the final stage after mixing. Um, I know I'm going to talk a little bit more in a different podcast and other videos about what the difference is and mastering itself, because I hear a lot of confusion around mastering, but mastering is, is when you take the final two track, two channel mix from a mixer that they 
they've done. And the mastering engineer takes it and just makes sure that the frequencies are, are overall balanced, that it fits into whatever project it's in, whether it's a single song or an EP or a record, and that it fits and plays back nicely on other stereo systems and that it's competitive volume for going on to streaming platforms and all that kind of stuff so that streaming doesn't screw it up completely or, or it's distorted or it's too loud or it's too quiet or anything like that. They kind of take care of that as well. That's a very general brief uh, description and we'll talk more about that in different podcasts, but that's what I'm talking about because I know there's a lot of, uh, I get a lot of people who, oh, I want it this mastered and it turns out they actually want it mixed and, and it's not that, you know, <laughs> very different things. Um, so I'm just clearing that up right off the top. So let's start with production and producers. So in rock, a producer would be somebody that kind of helps guide you along with your music and that helps hire the people that are, that are working on it, hire the engineer, hire the, the studio, uh, work on arrangement, song arrangement for you, and just kind of help, uh, guide the band and whatnot, um, to, to make the best song they can. And to me, a producer, well, it's very valuable. Yes, absolutely. And I, I am a producer. I produce lots of bands. I work with lots of bands and I help them out while I'm engineering them, all that kind of stuff. And there's a lot of producer engineers engineers out there and all that kind of thing too. But to get a dedicated producer for, for that purpose, when you're starting out is probably not the best, uh, use of your money. Um, you know, if you're not going to spend money on actually getting it mixed on actually getting it recorded, well, it doesn't matter if you have the best producer in the industry. Um, you, you need good songs. You need to hone in on your own sound before they can change your sound. If you don't even know what you're doing, um, they might be able to help, but somebody in your, in your band or your group should maybe take a more production role and kind of be the overarching final say that kind of moves things along. Yes, but you don't need to hire a dedicated producer right off the hop. That's probably not the best use of money because producers can get fairly expensive. And when you're just getting started, that's not a great return on investment. I don't think you need to hone in on your own songs. You need to improve on your own songwriting and production and everything else before you dedicate, you hire a dedicated producer. Um, in my opinion, and there are obviously that's a, that's a, a different thing because there's, there's, you know, creative things there and and they have more ideas. So if you really don't know what you're doing, then yeah, you, you probably should maybe get somebody to help you out. But hiring the best in the biz is not what you should do. And I talked a bit about that uh, in the last episode uh, or a couple of the recent episode about not paying for ego. Don't don't overpay for something that's not worth it and that, that it's, it's not going to happen. The other problem is that if you hire a really good, good massive producer, um, they're also going to only work in certain levels of studios with only certain certain levels of engineers and they're, they work in their process, which means that your budgeting is going to also go up. And so by doing that, by hiring said producer, you're now your recording budget's going to be way more. Your engineering budget's going to be way more and you're going to have to pay it because if you, if you want to work with them, you have to pay them and you have to pay the people they want to work with and you have to pay for the studios they want to work at and all that kind of stuff. There's all sorts of that kind of thing that happens. So for rock specifically, and, and, uh, that kind of genre genres surrounding that maybe maybe not the best use of money uh however in pop having a producer, somebody that's actually producing the track, making the track is sometimes something that you definitely need. If you're a solo artist and you just want to write songs and you want to sing over a track, maybe having a producer that kind of is a producer engineer kind of vibe, maybe that's well worth it for you. Maybe you, they can create the track that you hear in your head and you're just not going to ever get there and understand how to do it because it's all in the computer. It's all digital. It's all samples. It's all, uh, all sorts of stuff. And a producer is going to help you with that. So in that case, a producer is is a lot more worthwhile to get. Okay. Because you need that in, in rap and in hip hop and stuff, you need somebody to produce the beat in rock music and band related music. It's more about guiding the production than it is actually about making the track because you as a band are going to play it. Uh, you need an engineer to capture it or you need to record it somehow, but the producer is not actually adding to that. If you already know your songs, they're helping build your songs and they can help expand your songs and they can give you some different ideas to make it sound better. But sometimes an engineer, will help with that as well. So you got to understand who you're working with and what they're willing to do and how much they're willing to do. Cause there's a lot of engineers that'll kind of help a, a new band or a band getting started. Doesn't really know and go, you know what? You got to double these guitars or you got to add a lead 
guitar here, or, or this is the kind of sound we're going to get. Um, a producer will do that, but sometimes having a dedicated producer in that scenario isn't the greatest, isn't the greatest use of money. If you have an engineer that you maybe pay a little bit extra for that is going to help you with that. You know what I mean? So that's where it kind of the recording and, and the production kind of, um, it starts, it all blends together. Uh, but in pop and in hip hop and that kind of thing, you definitely, you need a producer to, to work with a lot of hip hop artists, a lot of rap artists, all that kind of th stuff. They have beat makers or they have producers that work and create. And in that case, producers, that producer is a different word in that sense, but it's creating the production. Um, so in those cases, it's, it's definitely a little more worth it. And hopefully you can find somebody that's also an engineer and maybe even a mixer that'll help you kind of do it all together in that world, in, in more, uh, sample based music and in, um, more digital based music where it's, where it's a lot in the computer, especially nowadays, then it, you can get more of those kind of people that are, that are do everything in a sense or do more of everything and just kind of more encompassing. Um, so then it's, it's a bit more worth it. So moving on to recording. So this is the actual recording thing. And you have, there's many different costs in this uh, engineering, there's studio time, there's gear, there's rentals, whatever it is that you need. And there's also, you got to think of, you know, you, if you're a guitar band, if you're a rock band, you need to have new guitar strings and that kind of stuff. And that that's a hundred percent worth it. The guitar strings, by the way, hundred percent worth every penny to make your recording sound better. But when it comes to recording, recording is actually one of the things that I think in this day and age can be the easiest to be replaced and to be DIY would um, because of the amount of resources that are out there and the a barrier in entry has become so low. And what I mean by this is skipping ahead. If you're willing to pay for a good mixer, you can do a lot of recording on your own and they can help guide you a little bit. If you have somebody that knows what they're doing with recording, you can do a lot of it yourself and get a great production out of it. If you have a good mixer, um, and we'll get to mixing in a second, but you know, this day and age, especially for a rock band, let's start with a rock band, um, is, is to, to record yourself, you need, you know, drums, you could do MIDI drums and just send that to a mixer and they can make amazing sounding drums. You don't need to record real drums at a studio. Um, those are some of the more expensive things to record, but it's also some of the easiest stuff to just get a professional to do it on the back end on, on the mixing end. Um, so, you know, that's one of those things. It's a trade-off. Uh, but recording guitars, you need a guitar DI recorded into an interface. If you are willing to learn some things, you can learn how to record some of this stuff because a recording a guitar DI is pretty easy. You get a, an interface to record it. Uh, sometimes they actually have the DI built into them. So you have the DI into it. So you get a guitar plugged into the interface and record the, the dry DI as long as it's not peaking and not clipping. Then you can put an amp sim on it. You can do whatever you want after the fact and it'll sound great. And any professional mixer or any mixer that you can get can deal with that after the fact. So it's very easy to just make sure that it's not peaking. You don't need to create a sound. You just need to make sure there's not being recorded distorted <laughs> and crunchy. That's not reversible. <laughs> you know what I mean? So when it comes to recording, there is a lot that can be done, especially for rock that's DIY. You can record MIDI drums. You can rent a MIDI drum, an E drum, an E kit, uh, and, and record MIDI drums. Very easy. Get a guitar and, and a cable into an interface to record a, a DI done. There's your guitars, all your guitars, all your layers, all your stuff that you want to record. You can do it all yourself with even GarageBand or Logic or whatever. You don't need Pro Tools to do it, but you need something. And then vocals, you need to make sure that that's not peaking. And for, to a degree, it's also very easy to do. Yes, you can go fancier. Every one of these things you can get way fancier. Obviously it can cost millions to make a record if you wanted to, but the bare minimum is just make it not peak and make it have a decent level. That's easy enough to learn how to do. And then the operation of the software to go to the beginning of the session, hit record, record what you need to record, and then send it off to a mixer to make it sound really good. As long as the bare minimum is there, they can do quite a, a, a good job. And I've done tons of projects like this. I have tons of stuff where bands will record themselves in their, in their rehearsal space. And it's just so easy for them. And they send it to me and I can make it sound like a million bucks because the technology is there nowadays and the barrier to entry for these things is very low and very easy to do. So if you're going to cut money, if you're trying to save money, uh, doing some of some DIY recording is not a terrible option, especially if you're a rock band. If you are a pop artist or something, you need a producer, you need somebody to make the track. If you're not 
somebody that's going to learn how to make tracks and buy all the software to make tracks, then yes, you need somebody to make the track. However, when it comes to recording, either the producer that you're working with can record your vocals, uh, or you get, you know, garage band and slot in the track that they send you and get a, a half decent USB microphone, even bare minimum, or an interface and a, and a nice microphone or something like that and learn to record your own vocals and you can record your vocals at home and get a, a decent little, you know, corner of the room and blanket it off and just make it as dead as you can. And that kind of thing. Again, you can learn how to do that very easily, but what it comes down to is how much are you willing to learn? How many resources, what resources do you have first off and how much are you willing to learn? Some people are not willing, you're not willing to learn that and that's okay. You don't want to spend time learning how to record yourself, learning how to use the software, even just that much. But I can say that if you put money and time into learning how to do DIY recordings, it can pay dividends because you buy a, a decent interface, a two track interface for a vocal and a guitar input, you know, and use MIDI drums or whatever, but you buy an interface for 200 bucks, you buy some software logic for 200 bucks, 300 bucks, whatever it is, and learn how to use that and spend a, a couple months learning how to use it, learning, becoming somewhat proficient at it. So you can actually be creative in it and record yourself and learn the bare minimums with things like even my channel, or just there's tons of resources out there on YouTube and on the internet internet in general of how to get started in basic recording stuff. Um, but use those resources and learn how to do it. And that two, four, six hundred dollars worth of stuff that you just bought, let's, let's call it a thousand dollars worth of stuff that you just bought and time and then time to, to learn how to use it. That can keep you recording yourself for songs and songs and songs and songs and songs later. Meanwhile, you could easily spend a thousand dollars on studio time to record, uh, on one song easily spend a thousand dollars just in studio time alone on one song. But if you put the time in and the money in up front and learn how it'll, you can use that now for 25 songs <laughs> instead of one, right? You see what I mean? It pays off down the line if you have interest. And if you want to learn how to do that and just learn how to do the bare minimums. So to me, recording is one of those things uh, that is easily, uh, turned into a DIY or more DIY kind of thing and can be achieved a good, a good product for less money. If you're working with a producer, if you're a, an artist and you're working with a producer, if you're a singer, uh, then oftentimes they will do a lot of that stuff themselves as well. They'll, they'll, will also record for you with you do a lot of programming stuff. Cause there's so much of that in the computer and then have you come by and do vocals yourself, or you only need a day of studio time to do vocals vocals for, um, for one song or five songs or whatever it is. And that, that also can work. And, and vocals is the kind of thing that you can get away with doing like a couple hours in a studio or an hour or two in a studio and rent it for just an hour or two. When it gets to doing drums, most studios need half a day to a day minimum because it's just so much setup and so much time. But for vocals, it's one mic. You can come in literally for half an hour and actually get a song done in half an hour if, if you're that kind of a singer. Um, so studios are more willing to rent you a studio to do vocals and there's smaller and cheaper studios to do vocals in if all you're doing is vocals. When it gets to drums, you need a drum room, you need mics, you need gear. You you just need more things to facilitate that. So that gets more and more expensive. So for certain things and for a lot of genres, the only thing that really needs to be recorded when it comes to rock and pop stuff, especially is vocals. And you can easily do that yourself or have your producer that you're working with do it at their own home studio or production suite. Um, or if not, you can get a small studio that cause you just need a dead room with a good microphone and somebody to hit record for you. Right? So you can do that for fairly cheaply. Um, now that being said, if you're a jazz band or something like that, yes, you're going to probably need to get a studio to record in. It's, it's harder to do some of those genres with fake drums and fake guitars and all that kind of stuff. So you're going to need that. But Typically with those kind of genres, you can also go into a studio and it seems that bands like that are able to record a record in a day. So you get a good studio for a thousand bucks for a day that can fit everybody there sitting together, playing a record, and you can get a whole record recorded in a day if you know what you're doing. You know what I mean? So with those styles of genres, 
you can get away with a, a little bit more of that and less DIY stuff. But with pop and rock, especially, there's a lot more nuanced things that you have to do and you're going to layer stuff and you're going to figure out the songs and hear them and, and chop them up, up because a lot of bands record without having actually played the song live a bazillion and a half times, they kind of craft it while they're writing it almost. And that is a beautiful part about recording, frankly, and why I love recording. But you know, when you're doing that, you don't want to be dishing out money for engineers and studios every single time you want to do that. That's why DIY or doing it yourself in some capacity is worth the time investment and the money investment up front to learn how to do it because it, like I said, it pays dividends for a long time. Now, when it gets to off the beaten path kind of thing, sometimes it is worth it. If you want a string quartet to play live, yeah, probably get a studio. It's probably worth it. If you can't program it and you know, your living room doesn't sound great, it's maybe not worth it at that point. And those, if they sound bad, they sound bad. Then it's worth it to just go to a studio and get them done right. But like I said, if you're doing a one song, maybe it's not worth it. Maybe you need to actually think about it. Let's do five songs at once, or let's do 10 songs at once. No matter how we release them down the line, let's kind of bundle them together when recording because we can do more time or more uh, things with the time that we can get. Like I said, with studios, you can get a day in a studio. If you have to spend a day, you can get more done in a day if you're bundling four songs or five songs together than you would if you have one song and you're going in and you still have to spend a minimum of a day. You know what I mean? So just think about that when you're planning. Doesn't matter how you release it, but if you bundle things together, once you're set up, things can go faster and go easier and it becomes cheaper if you do more things all together. That's the same thing literally with DIY it gets cheaper every song that you do and that you record yourself or parts of yourself because it, it contributes to that song and then the next song and the next song. So now the same investment of a microphone and interface and software and the time to learn how to use it. Uh, sure. That's a lot for one song, but 10 songs down the road or 20 songs down the road, it's now well, well more worth it. You know what I mean? So, um, that's just something to, to think about when recording. Now that leads me to the next thing, which is, uh, mixing, mixing and editing. I think editing is worth it personally, but if you'd spend the time to play it right and don't want it edited, then that's totally fine as well. Um, but to me, editing is a nice check over everything and just kind of tightening everything up and just knowing that it's there also genre specific, obviously, but, uh, I think that it's worth it and you can get some good editors, uh, for not stupidly expensive. So it's, it's worth it at that point to just get a separate editor, not yourself to edit things. Um, especially vocals, especially vocals. But that being said, if you want to spend time and, and learn how to edit, then all the power to you and you'll, you'll be able to kind of be the editor and put on the editing hat and learn how to do it. Um, and editing is something that you can totally do if you're willing to do it and try and actually do it well, uh, because it's also something that can be done very poorly, very easily. So make sure that you're actually putting the time in, but it can also be done yourself. Then there is mixing and mixing is the one thing that I always tell bands, this is where you need to put your money. If you're doing everything else DIY, if you're recording in your house, if you bought an interface and garage band or logic, and you're learning how to do this and you are recording and you're kind of half producing it yourself, or you have your buddy that's kind of help half helping you produce. Cause he kind of makes music too, whatever it is. If you're a rock band learning, if you're a pop artist, whatever the case may be, Mixing is where the money needs to go. And if you're a pop artist, if you're doing more pop or rap or that kind of thing, oftentimes the producer will also mix it. And that's totally fine too. But make sure that you actually have somebody mixing it. Uh, don't make somebody who's producing it, produce it, and then just skip the mixing step. The mixing step is one of the more important things. I mean, it's all important because if you don't record it, then you have nothing to mix, do you? So, <laughs> but mixing can be such a huge benefit uh, to people. Um, so I think mixing is worth every penny that you can put into it. And I think mixing is worth still outsourcing. If you are doing a lot of recording on your own, you love recording, you can still outsource the mixing down the road. I think it's so worth it for two reasons. One, is being a really good mixer takes a lot of time. And for a lot of people, becoming a really good mixer for your own stuff isn't always worth it because you just kind of want it to get done and whatever. So you're not going to put the time in to really learn the craft. And the other thing is, is that it's a different set of skills. It's a different uh, creative 
uh, outlook on the project. And it's always nice to have that second set of ears on it. Having an outside mixer who's not attached to the song, who hasn't heard every iteration of it, who hasn't kind of been there the whole time is really nice to have because they're going to come at the sounds and the things happening in the production differently than you or your producer or whatever we're doing with it in the first place. So mixing, because they have another opinion, it's nice to just have that second opinion, that second look at it because they might think of different things and they might help develop the song differently with all the elements that you give them than you would. They're going to mix it differently. They're going to give the song different dynamics. They're going to give it different sounds. This manipulate the sounds a little differently that you wouldn't have thought of because you're so deep in the project. So at the point of mixing, it's so nice to have somebody else's opinion, uh, like a good mixer that can actually take it to the next level instead of being bogged down. Because what happens a lot of the time is if you're self recording and you're throwing amp sims on there and whatever, you're going to get used to what you're hearing. And when it comes to mixing, you're either going to go, well, I can hear everything. It's good. Done. Or you're going to get so, uh, try to get into it, but just keep coming back to the way that it was or not trying to improve, but you're not really improving. You're just changing it to be different. Whereas an outside mixer isn't attached to anything. So if they think it's good, they'll leave it. And if they don't think it's good, they will change that sound. And they're going to do that throughout the whole song. And you're going to end up with something better because they are a better judge of what's good versus different or what gets better versus just different. Um, that's why you hire them. That's why it's worth it. Whereas you, if you're doing a lot of self-recording, that's tougher to do because you've been in it. You're just thinking of it very differently. So, to me, mixing is worth every penny. Now, what I'm saying is not get the biggest and best mixers on the planet to mix your stuff. No, but get somebody probably better than, you know, 50 bucks for a mix or 20 bucks for a mix. Um, to probably get somebody better than that, but you can get a good mix for four or 500 bucks a song even. Um, and there are tons of great people that are on their way up that are trying to make a name for themselves that actually do have some great skills that, um, that you, you might really enjoy working with that aren't that expensive and that you should go for that. That's okay. Do that. And again, if you bundle a bunch of songs together, typically mixers will give you a better deal if you have a whole bunch of songs in kind of one package in one kind of thing, because they can, it just, once they're into the process, once they're into your sound, they can do the rest of the songs easily. But if they have to kind of get into it, do one song and then be done until you send them the next one, six months later, that can all, that can deter them a little bit. And that can, you know, it's like, Oh, I got a, my setup cost, so to speak is a bit more. So just something to think about when it comes to hiring a mixer, try and again, bundle some more songs together. You might get a better rate out of them. Just try and find some other local band that's worked with somebody or just get some references for different people. They don't have to be the biggest name. They don't have to have massive credits. They they have to have stuff that you enjoy listening to that you think sounds good and that would fit what you do. Um, but beyond that, you know, th just because they're stupidly expensive does not mean they are great. And just because somebody's stupidly expensive and is great doesn't mean that they need, that's where you need to spend all of your money. Again, it, it needs to be distributed a little bit when you're getting started, but mixing, I think should take the cake for uh, how percentage of the budget should go to mixing and you should spend half decently on a mix uh, for your song, uh, especially if you're home recording it, especially if you're doing a lot on your own, because like I said, you can record MIDI drums, which are dead easy to record. There's, there isn't even any engineering involved. You plug in a cable and record it. <laughs> um, so you can do that, but a good mixer can turn that into a great sounding drum kit and they will. Whereas a, somebody that's not great is going to turn that into something not great. And then it's like, oh, that sounds DIY. But if you pay a little bit extra and get a, a good, a decent mixer that will now turn into something that's like, oh, wow, that sounds amazing. You know, it's worth it to that. Do you want the $50 mixer? No. Do you want the $6,000 mixer? No. But the $600 mixer, that that's probably going to be good. That's probably going to be where you want to go and find bands that recommend them as well, that you like working, that they like working with them. So then we get on to mastering and mastering again, doesn't need to be massively expensive, but to me, mastering is well worth it just to have, again, that last step. It's the last thing. Do not self master is the biggest thing. Don't self master. Try all you can not to self master mixers come sometimes will master as well. That's totally fine as well, because it's a separate, again, a separate person from you that's doing it. Somebody else that's doing it. Uh, another set of ears. I typically like to break up mixing and mastering as well. 
um, and I'm, I'm a mixer, but I don't do a ton of mastering just because I like to separate them. Put it this way. I don't master any of the things I mix. I have mastering guys for that. Um, but you know, when you're, when your budget is thin, <laughs> let's say, I still think a few dollars should be put towards mastering, um, to go on top of the mix. Or if the mixer does mastering as well, then that, you know, that could work also, but ask your mixer if they do mastering or if it, if they would do mastering for a smaller cost, maybe they'd only add 25 bucks onto the mixing cost to do the mastering as well. Some mixers will do that. Um, others will be like, no, I don't, I need it mastered by somebody else. And my mastering guys are X amount and really think about it then, because if you're willing to put money into the mix, Mix, you don't want to ruin it on the last step. Yes, it's it's subtle sometimes. Sometimes it's not, you know, people often get masters back and go, is this any different from the mix that you sent me? Like, what's the big deal? Or like, oh yeah, it's subtly different. Why did that cost that much? And sometimes it's, you know, it's it's it is subtle, but it's also the reassurance of this is the last step. This is the last thing. I don't want to ruin everything that I've put all this time and money and energy into and the great mix that I got that I'm super happy with. I don't want it to be completely changed by the mastering guy um, and potentially wrecking it. So I want somebody that I can trust and just give me the files that I now need to upload it to streaming services and all that kind of stuff. You need to make sure that that last step is really, really good. It's just, it's a nice peace of mind for everybody involved that they know that the mastering has been done right. Now, that being said, uh, you can get good mastering guys for 50 bucks a track and that's good. And I think you should scrape together at least that. And if you can't seem to find any, or people don't know that, you know, obviously reach out to me. I have some, some guys I can direct you towards, but that is kind of, to me, a minimum kind of thing. 40, 50 bucks a song, uh, is a good route. You don't need $200 a song, $400 a song for mastering. You don't need that. Are they going to be good? They're probably going to be good, but you know, you don't need to, if your budget is stretched thin, that's not where you need to put all of your money. Again, like I said, the bulk of the money I think should go towards mixing, uh, and, and getting yourself set up to record yourself and do a bit of self-recording. If you have interest in that, if you're willing to do that, but mastering is, uh, again, one of those things that should be there, but doesn't need to be the top tier, but shouldn't be the worst tier either. Don't, don't just put 20 bucks to say, yeah, I got a mastering guy. Get somebody half decent because you, again, you don't want to ruin it on the last step, you know? So that kind of sums up my thoughts on that one. And please go to the YouTube channel for this episode or go to my website, uh, anacreates.ca slash podcast and find this episode and comment what you think. Let me know your thoughts or what, or if you have any questions that you want me to answer, because I'm sure there'll be a follow-up to this with uh, some more questions and some more things, because there's just so much of this to talk about so many different scenarios, but I hope this gave kind of an overview and some just kind of ideas just to, I just wanted to let some of my thoughts out about this, um, to see what you guys said and to see, uh, the response to where I should go with some of this content, because I really feel strongly that people can record themselves and make a gr amazing sounding stuff. And that's kind of the key takeaway of this is if you're willing to learn and if you're willing to, uh, put the time in and a couple bucks in, you can learn how to record yourself and you can do some home recording stuff that is amazing. You do not need $2,000 a day studios, $1,000 a day studios, $500 a day studios. Even you don't need those things to make a great sounding record. They're nice. They take other, uh, responsibilities off of you because you can then do what you need to do and get an engineer in there to do their thing, uh, and record you at the studio large or small or whatever. But, uh, it's nice. Absolutely. I'm not saying it's not nice, but I'm kind of coming at this from a point of view of, we don't have a ton of money. Where do we spend it? What should we think about to, to get started something? And to me, that's mixing. Mixing is the biggest one that if you do some self-recording, get some half these today, these this day and age self-recording, like equipment for home recording is, can be very cheap to get started and it's going to be good. It's still decent quality stuff. It's, you know, the lowest end is still pretty, is going to get you going pretty well, but mixing Mixing is where it's going to take that mediocre stuff, that okay stuff, that getting started stuff and turn it into something amazing still. And there's still possibility for that. If you spend money on a good mixer, those are my thoughts. Learn how to record. It's going to pay dividends in the, in, in the long term. uh, get a good mixer and don't cheap out on, don't, don't totally cheap out on mastering because it's the final check. Just have that self, that reassurance that everything is correct. Everything works and everything's going to sound good when you put it out, because what's the point of you spending all of this money and then getting it mastered by something not good, somebody not good and it coming out and it sounds 
sounds like crap compared to everything else on somebody's playlist, they're going to delete you off the playlist so fast and you're never going to get any fans anyway. So it's not worth cheaping out on that either. Um, so it's, it's kind of as you get more into the process, don't cheap out, <laughs> you know, because it's going to negate everything before that point uh, if you do that. So, um, yeah, hopefully that gives you some thoughts at least. Please ask some questions. Find me on Twitter, Instagram, uh, comment on this episode on YouTube or on my website. That's where you can kind of comment on these episodes because podcasting doesn't have comments yet. Um, but anyway, there are always going to be trade offs and there are always going to be different scenarios. And there's always, th this is, you know, such scratching the surface of ideas. Is. So I just thought I'd start here uh, with some thoughts to, to get you started um, and, and hopefully point you in the right direction and get you thinking at least, uh, because this is kind of the stuff that I wish I heard when I first started to understand what am I, where am I going with this? And this is what I find a lot of people who are getting started need that little reminder of and, uh, and kind of nudge in the right direction to even start asking the right questions. You know, that's the biggest thing at, there. You can ask the right questions at least. So anyway, that is it for this episode though, guys, thank you so much for watching and and of course, go subscribe on the YouTube channel, uh, at, which you can find through my main channel or go to my website, antcreates.ca. Um, let me know any of your follow-up questions, uh, comments, anything like that. That is it. I will see you in the next episode. Until then, always be creating.